Introducing the Jeffrey Epstein I Knew, a new podcast from CNN, hosted by Vicki Ward. The seven-episode series takes you behind the scenes to hear a one-of-a-kind account of Epstein, an individual who's more myth than man. Vicki Ward has been reporting on Jeffrey Epstein for almost two decades and takes listeners beyond the headlines to explore who Jeffrey Epstein really was, where he got his money, and the circumstances surrounding his death. Subscribe to The Jeffrey Epstein I Knew wherever you get your podcast. I don't have time to be stuck at home this season with the flu, and neither do you. This winter, trust Zycam to knock out a cold at the first sneeze of the season. Other cold medicines only mask cold symptoms. But Zycam is homeopathic and clinically proven to shorten colds when taken at the first sign. Not only is Zycam cold remedy safe and effective, but the citrus rapid melts are easy to take with you on the go. And they even quickly dissolve in your mouth without water. You can find Zycam cold remedy products at all major retailers, including Amazon, Walmart, and Target. Visit Zycam.com garage to receive a $2 coupon on your next Zycam purchase. John Bonet Ramsey. She was strangled with a cord. Little Miss Colorado. Six-year-old murder victim John Benet Ramsey. Unknown intruder. Her brother. John Benet Ramsey. Oh my God! They still have not interviewed the parents. John Ramsey didn't do it, and he didn't have a clue of anybody to do this. My life has been hell from that day forward, and I want nothing more than to find out who was responsible for this. Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed. And if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you, getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence an earlier pickup of your daughter. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you to not provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., will result in your daughter being beheaded. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. If you alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You will be scanned for electronic devices, and if any are found, she dies. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny 
as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good southern common sense of yours. It is up to you now, John. Victory. SBTC. Okay, most people use the phrase ransom note. I'm going to call this a ransom letter because as you just heard, it is long. Most ransom notes are short. We have your daughter. We want $500,000. Do not involve the police. We will contact you. This ransom letter is two and a half pages long, written on your standard run-of-the-mill eight and a half by 11 and three-quarters inch paper. Now, what you're going to hear is the captain and I tear through this ransom letter. You're going to get our opinions on different pieces of this letter, as well as the instructions given to John Ramsey on how to get his daughter back. Our opinions are going to be a combination of our personal opinions, plus information that we've collected from other sources along the way who have scrutinized this same ransom letter. I'll start us off, Captain, with this. Up at the top of the letter, at the beginning of the letter, yeah, there is this great website out there that's called statementanalysis.com. Okay, so some of our thoughts or some of the things that we mention here will include their thoughts as well. They are a great website because they analyze these types of ransom letters as well as 911 calls, and they have experience doing this. You and I, well, we got a little bit of experience ourselves doing this as we've been doing it now for several years. But statementanalysis.com, they state, as well as a couple of the books that I've read on this case, the first line that they kind of question is the, we are a group of individuals. And they point to this because a lot of people says this letter as a whole just doesn't make sense. Right. And one thing that I want to keep in mind here, and we kind of, you know, did a little running around in our discussion last week about this case. But I think what's very important in the John Benet Ramsey case to keep in mind, when you're looking at each one of these items, as we're going to do, I think you need to stay fluid and you need to stay in the moment of what's going on with the case. You know, we were talking about the police showing up and how they didn't secure the scene. And, uh, you know, people would point out, well, they don't even know if it is a crime, if a crime took place. Right. Why should they secure it? Again, I believe that you want to stay fluid in that moment. When you show up, you have indicators pointing toward a kidnapping for ransom. And so, therefore, it is a crime scene. So, obviously, we do know some things that are going to come to light. We can look at those as much as we want. But in the moment, keep in, keep in mind, in the moment, stay fluid as we go through this. Statementanalysis.com, as well as several other sources, again, points out that the letter as a whole does not make sense. And they specifically reference the line of, we are a group of individuals, pointing out what exactly does that mean? What does the writer of this letter mean right because every group is comprised of individuals i think it's a lie <laughs> we are a group of individuals you would just say we are a group that's true the other thing too that john douglas would point out in his experience with ransom letters is that often the the kidnapper is the authority in the situation they're the ones that are going to call the shots they're the ones demanding the ransom you're going to do this or that or this or that's going to happen or not going to happen. Yeah. And he points out in his experience that often a you want to perceive a larger threat than what is actually going on because you as the kidnapper really only knows what everything that's going on. The victims don't know everything that's going on. They only know what you choose to tell them in your letter. Right. So John Douglas would point out hey, we are a group of individuals. We are a group. If it was, in fact, just one person that kidnapped and, and wrote this letter, then that makes sense to him because they would want to present themselves as a larger than life, a larger threat. They're right. bigger. They're scarier. It's not just one person. It's a group. Right, and that evidence is followed back 
uh, we represent a small foreign faction. I think just that term is to back up the idea of a group of individuals. The small foreign faction makes it seem like uh, something bigger. And then when you get to, we respect your business, but not the... We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. Yeah. Again, I think that's to back up the small foreign faction. Uh, This sounds very movie-like to me. Yeah. My thoughts here, they represent a small foreign faction. The use of the word small doesn't make sense to most because now it's, it's the opposite. Where you say we are a group, you're trying to make yourself seem bigger, the threat seem more real, bigger. Now small is taking that down a notch. Foreign faction sounds scary. Sounds scary to me. But it, it's weird just those words together. The use of the word foreign sounds odd. Even if they would be foreigners to us, they likely wouldn't call themselves foreigners. They would say something like, we are the Islamic Jihad. Right. They wouldn't call themselves a small foreign faction. I, I think it was Cyril, uh, Cyril Weck's book where he states even a small foreign faction would not call themselves a small foreign faction. It's just a weird, weird statement. Yeah, but I think right away it's it's establishing the mindset. You know, this individual thinks that they're going to outsmart people with this nonsense. Um, I think the biggest thing in the letter to point to that it's not a group of individuals is when he changes the narrative and I'm going to say he, but when he says, I will call you, I will call you between eight and 10 AM. Now I'm jumping some lines there, but I think that goes back to a group of individuals. The we turns to I correct. And to me, that's proof that there was never a we that's like a Freudian slip, right? Yeah. That's, that's interesting because at first analysis for me, what my thought was, if he's saying, and I agree with you, we'll continue to say he, if he is saying we are a group, oh, and these men have your daughter, right? You follow my instructions. Maybe he's the leader of this group. Maybe he's the brains, the mastermind behind this whole operation. And he's the one that's going to be giving the instructions. What makes that not work, that theory not work is as you just pointed out that it starts with we and it ends with i so it does change along the way yeah and i think some people would argue well because he's not with the other two individuals so that's maybe why he changes to i will call you because they're going to be with your daughter but that's too much information it's almost like stating like once he goes to i again if there's a group well they're with your daughter they'll be monitoring you i'm not going to be with your daughter Mm mm-hmm very strange but i think also we can start by looking at this note and i think it's pretty clear to most people that it starts off a little sloppier and gets nicer as we go with the handwriting yeah the penmanship yeah not a lot nicer but a little bit nicer and i wonder um okay so there's so much to get into one where did this individual write the note? We we do know that the, the paper, this came from a pad inside the Ramsey's home. That's right. There was a pin that was found in their home that they believe was the pin for the note. So this could go multiple ways. Did the person possibly steal the pad, write the note, And then bring it back. My issue with that idea would be, well, yeah, you wrote the note, but why would you bring back the pad? doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. But the note seems creased, which to me, why would you crease a note if you're writing it in the kitchen or where that pad would be? And then you're just transferring it over to the steps. Why crease it at all? The crease is very weird to me as well. And I'm, I'm with you that I've never thought of the idea of somebody writing the letter elsewhere and then returning it to the scene. 
Not that that's impossible. Anything, (laughs) in this case in particular, anything seems to be possible. The crease is odd because wouldn't your objective, your goal as the kidnapper who wants a ransom, now there's people out there going, well, we, you know, we know this and we know that. Again, I'm staying fluid in the moment and analyzing this particular item. This is evidence as it is right. in the moment. If we are to believe the ransom letter, the goal of the, the author of this letter would be for the parents of this girl to find the letter as soon as possible. Why? We know that because of instruction given in the letter. Do not contact the authorities. If they discover their daughter missing before they find this letter, they could very well screw up that whole instruction by not knowing any better and calling the authorities. Our daughter is missing. Right. We haven't found the letter yet. Why crease it? Patsy Ramsey says she finds it on the spiral staircase and it's three pages and it's laid out side by side. So we know that at some point, The letter was not to be concealed. It was to be obvious. It was to be found by the parents and for the sake of not contacting the authorities. Well, I'll tell you what, why why don't we try to start at the, at the top of the letter and just work our way through and try to hit each thing along the way. I think it'd be easier for us all to play along at home. The letter starts off addressed to Mr. Ramsey, not to John Ramsey, not to John and Patsy, not to the parents, but to straight up Mr. Ramsey, which I find to be interesting for several different reasons. It's a choice that the author is making. It's a choice to only address this to Mr. Ramsey. A lot of these ransom notes that we've seen in the past, they don't even need to address it to anyone. The line that we have your daughter clarifies exactly who the letter was intended for. Right. So it was a choice to address it to Mr. Ramsey. Now, one thing that a lot of the TV shows and documentaries point out in this case, the next line is listen carefully. And they all point to that being weird because this is a letter. It's not a speech. It's not somebody shouting threats at somebody or calling on the phone. This is a letter. You're reading the words. The words say, listen carefully. You don't listen. You're reading. I get it. That's never seemed weird to me. I, I've always taken that as just like, I'm the authority, listen carefully, here we go. Yeah, I think it's a little strange. It almost sounds like something you'd say on the phone, calling them, listen carefully, I have your daughter. Yeah. But I also think, is it that big of a deal? Probably not, but also I wonder if that points in any direction on where they got this possible idea to kidnap a, a girl in the first place. All right, then we have the letter... We respect your business. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have your daughter. We want $118,000 or she dies. But oh, by the way, Mr. Ramsey, here's a mild compliment. We respect your business. Right. Shows that they almost care about Mr. Ramsey at some, on some level. And some people have pointed out that if Patsy Ramsey was the author of the ransom letter, that she may have chose to mention this to create some kind of distance between John's company and the investigation. Right. Regardless, the writer is aware of John Ramsey's business per the letter and that he is successful. Right. If the writer is interested in a ransom, they are targeting what many believe to be a weird amount of money, $118,000 in cash at the ready. Mm Mm-hmm. According to Steve Thomas's book, John Bonet, Inside the Ramsey Murder Investigation, from a leading detective on the case, the author wrote, we D-O, letters D-O, with the D-O crossed out. We, uh-huh. we do respect your business. De- detective Thomas takes that to mean either we do respect your business or the author was starting to write out, we don't respect your business but then change their mind mid sentence. This, this you really have to question as it goes to motive, right? Because at this moment in the investigation, looking at this letter, this is supposed to be laying out the motive for what is going on here. And it would point out that the author is, if Thomas is right, that they were starting to write, don't, we don't respect your business, right? That the author is undecided 
if they respect Ramsey's business up into the point of writing that sentence. If it is an intruder who wrote the letter, it's just weird. You broke into this man's home, and according to the letter, to kidnap a small child and threaten the parents with the beheading of the child, yet you're undecided on how you feel about John's business. Yeah, but I also think, to me, this point says somebody copying a letter. Mm -hmm. Uh, My gut feeling says that this letter was composed somewhere else, and they thought to be, I'm going to be real smart about this and get away with it, so... Therefore, I'm going to write the letter inside the house. I'll use a pen from inside the house. I'll use a paper from inside the house. I'm going to bring the letter that I wrote with me. And it might have stated, we do respect your your business, but then messed up and then realized, well, you can just put, we respect your business. That works too. But there's ob- obviously there's an edit there. But I, but I, I believe the person is reading off their letter. And maybe there's not a lot of light in the house. Mm-hmm. And so, again, I also think one of the reasons why it's sloppier in the beginning, a lot of people, when they start writing, it, it's a little sloppier. But I also think it's sloppier because this individual is now wearing gloves. And right. so I think, you know. Gloves and could be very nervous. Right. And maybe the nerves are easing up as they continue to write. I, I kind of am with uh, Steve Thomas here on his thoughts about believing that the writer was intending to write the word don't. We we don't or we do not respect your business because we do respect your business or we respect your business is the same sentence and it's not necessary to cross out do in that, in that moment. Right. So that seems weird. Now, the writer goes on to say, we respect your business, but not the country that it serves. So... <laughs> Are we to believe that John Bonet was kidnapped and then murdered because someone has a hatred for the United States? Most people would agree this crime is not an international incident. So it's just weird to put that in there that to play that toward motive, we, you know, maybe there's many factors based into why you are going to leave this letter. But to include we you know, the, 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 we don't respect the country that it serves, that your business serves. It just seems a a very strange thing. I think this is pointing out to what you say. It's not a group. It's not a small foreign faction, but if we mention some distaste or, or hatred for the United States in that same letter, it it's there to, it's purposely put there to confirm that we are a foreign entity. Right. Right. Again, I think it's as simple as I'm going to throw some of these things in to try to throw you off the scent of who I really am. But I think the fact that they sit there and say, well, we respect your business. That's a, they made that choice. Therefore they're showing some kind of concern for Mr. Ramsey. Later on, they show some concern for him when they say, uh, you know, be rested, uh, cause the, the delivery will be exhausting. I advise, you to be rested. You would not put that if you didn't care about the person on some level. This is another example of people say, well, this shows that Patsy could have wrote the note because she, the writer keeps showing affection almost for John on some level. Captain, I respect your talent, but not the garage that it serves. Mm. All right. Deal with that. Well, (laughs) get out of my garage. then. Well, as you pointed out, the writer misspells two very common words, uh, one of them being business and the other possession. However, the writer then correctly spells the words deviation and attache, even including the accent on the word attache. Yeah. Many believe that the writer purposely misspelled those two words to try to make it look like an uneducated person or, again, a foreign person wrote this note. Yeah, and a lot of people point that to be Patsy Ramsey and the idea that, okay, we're sitting down to write this note. We're trying to disguise our handwriting so we make it a little more sloppy at the beginning. That's hard to keep up over two and a half pages. So that's why the sloppiness goes away. But also, at first, went, oh, let me misspell a couple things to throw them off the scent. 
And then they kind of forgot about that because I don't think there's another misspelling for the next page and a half, I guess. As you point out, Captain, both of the misspellings occur when there is a double S, double letter S situation. I think maybe this could be a tell, almost like a signature or fingerprint, if in fact this was not made up, right? I want everyone to just stop and think for a minute. Do you have a couple of words that for whatever reason, your brain just seems to jumble up the letters in those words or, or, or screw up the spelling of those words, regardless of how often or how many times you look the word up, have it autocorrected or ask somebody for the spelling. Captain, did you think of any words that, that, that you have trouble with? Fish, pony, <laughs> hip hop, hip hop anonymous. Damn you, you give him all the easy ones. Oh, the whole English language is very difficult for me to spell anything correct. I wonder, again, like you said, is it a, a tell or is it on purpose? Not on purpose to spell it wrong, but is the author trying to give us a hint of who it is? Uh, by making these mistakes. So the reason why I say that it could be a signature or almost like a fingerprint for the author of the letter would be is if this person always misspells these two words right. and it, that somebody would be aware of that. Like for me, I know that vacuum and convenient, those two words, I'm like, I'm never going to spell them correctly. Mm -hmm. The W for years always screwed me up. I think I've straight, actually, I take that back. I think I've straightened out my vacuum situation. But for whatever reason, convenient is mm -hmm. the most inconvenient word for me because I always want to put the I in a weird spot. I, I will never get it right. But anybody that I have corresponded with many times may know that, that I always always have trouble with that word. And then they could think of, oh, Nick, the extra crispy colonel wrote this mm -hmm. ransom letter because he jumbled up the I and convenient. Yeah, I don't know why you'd put vacuum in a ransom note, but it's your ransom note, so it's your part. Yeah, you I didn't, what I didn't write a ransom note. I just asked everybody to think of some letter, some words that, that they always have trouble with. Well, I want to just mention that we have commas in here. So we have some kind of knowledge of writing and we also have the big one to me is your, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people get that wrong. There's different yours, right? Yeah. Off the top of my head, I think all the yours are correct. Yeah, I didn't look at that, so I'm guessing that they are. And I know a lot of people are probably sitting there going, everybody gets those right. Nope, nope. That's like the one of the number one pet peeves I have on Facebook is when people get their yours wrong. So I worked in a small office years ago. A and small I, foreign faction office? Yeah, and I remember there was a conversation that needed to be had, mm -hmm. if that's even correct grammar. Probably not. <laughs> but- there was a conversation that took place in a meeting where they addressed the office as a whole, probably not to embarrass one or two people in particular, but that was the, the exact conversation that they had to pass down that needed to trickle down to some of the employees. Your, yours are always wrong in, in your business letters and your emails and this, yeah. that, and the other thing. And it's a reflection of this company that, you don't know how to, you don't know proper grammar. Right. It's just like when it's there and there, all those like weather and weather, those drive me nuts when people get them wrong. Well, join us after the beer break when we discuss math. With HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. Break out of your dinner rut with HelloFresh's 20-plus seasonal chef-curated recipes each week. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie-smart and vegetarian. 
and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and Kraft Burgers. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality, regardless of your comfort in the kitchen. From step-by-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything that you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes. HelloFresh is flexible and fits your lifestyle. Add extra meals to your weekly order, as well as yummy add-ons like garlic bread and cookie dough, and easily change your delivery days, food preferences, and skip a week whenever you need. HelloFresh is a must-go-to for anybody that is busy, anybody that has a family, anybody that's cooking for one or two. I cannot stress this enough. The food is super fresh, super delicious, easy to cook and prepare, and you are going to amaze yourself and wow your friends and family with delicious meals. The captain and I have been subscribers for years, and I am now a ninja, full black belt and all, in the kitchen because of HelloFresh. Yeah, I feel like my skills in the kitchen have gone up immensely since we became subscribers. Get nine free meals with HelloFresh by going to HelloFresh.com slash garage nine and using our promo code garage nine. That's HelloFresh.com slash garage nine and enter our promo code garage nine. Simply Safe is my choice for home security. It's comprehensive, professional home security at a fair price. And right now is the best time of year to get a Simply Safe security system. My listeners get a free security camera plus a huge discount on your security system. Simply Safe protects every room, door, and window with 24 7 professional monitoring. A smart lock and video doorbell defend your front door from porch pirates. Inside, an arsenal of sensors and cameras cover every inch of your home. If there's a break-in, they can give real-time video confirmation to police as it happens. So police respond up to 3.5 times faster. Plus, Simply Safe makes it easy on you. There's no contract, hidden fees, or fine print. And prices start at just $15 a month. Visit simplysafe.com slash garage to get a free camera plus Simply Safe's holiday savings. This offer is for a limited time only, and it's ending soon. Visit simplysafe.com slash garage today. That's simplysafe.com slash garage. Designed with measurements for millions of women, Third Love's bra styles are made to fit your life. They have over 80 bra sizes, but know that the only one that matters is yours. We love Third Love. Proud to sponsor Third Love. My mother and my sister, it's their favorite sponsor of the show. The feedback that we have received from friends and family... And listeners across the board, hands down, they say that Third Love is their go-to when shopping for their bras. The comfort and the quality is top-notch. And I've even spoke to some ladies that say they will only shop at Third Love now that they've tried their fantastic products. This is hands down the most comfortable bra you'll own. With straps that won't slip, tagless labels, and lightweight memory foam cups mold to your shape. Plus, returns and exchanges are free and easy. In fact, thanks to Third Love's Perfect Fit promise, every customer has 60 days to wear it, wash it, and put it to the test. And if you don't love it, return it, and Third Love will wash it and donate it to a woman in need. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone, so right now they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com garage now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash garage for 15% off today. All right, we are back. Cheers, me mateys. A cheers to you, Captain, as I raise a glass of Christmas Bomb 2019 by the awesome folks at Prairie Artisan Ales. This is an Imperial Stout, 13% ABV, garage grade, four out of five bottle caps. Cheers to everyone. As we continue on to the next portion of our ransom letter, it states, at this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed. And if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. So the writer tells us, we have your daughter in our possession. Most people would agree the shortest way to say something is the best way to state it, especially in a ransom letter. A true kidnapper 
would have said, we have your daughter. The words in our possession are simply understood and unnecessary. And really just in those couple of lines, there seems to be several extra and unnecessary words. Next, you will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. The amount of $118,000, this all, things considered, is a relatively small amount of money based off of the Ramsey's wealth or perceived wealth. And John Ramsey's company is doing very well. They just did a billion in annual sales. This was made public. We discussed the news articles that came out regarding this. John's net worth in 1996 was in the millions. And wouldn't you agree a nice round number would be more typical than $118,000? So there should be a reason why the writer chose $118,000. And even John Ramsey agrees that that number, 118, is could be significant to the killer. Yeah. A couple things here. One, if we believe the writer on what they're stating, I'm calling you. We have two people that have your daughter. So we at least have three individuals. So now you have to split that three ways. So I, th- I thought we think it was one person. No, but what I'm saying is if we believe the. Oh, the letter. Yeah. Where it says the right. two men watching over your daughter. Yeah. Three so people. We're at a minimum three. That makes the amount even lower. Everybody's going to get roughly about 40 grand. Mm-hmm. What's that going to do for you? Right. It It's not worth the risk of, <laughs> of the amount of prison time that you're signing yourself up for if you get caught. Right. So not a large amount, but that, again, goes back to the idea that we're probably dealing with one individual and not two, or, again, somebody that is falsifying a ransom note to cover up a murder. And one thing that's been pointed out many, many times over the years, in fact, it was pointed out very early on in the investigation and the public's uh, investigation into the Ramseys, let's say, was that the amount may have been significant because John Ramsey's Christmas bonus or annual bonus for 1996 was right around the same dollar amount. Yeah. There was actually two things. One, his same dollar amount roughly for the bonus. And I wonder if this is also kind of a tip of the hat to why I'm asking for this amount, because I know you got it as a bonus. Mm -hmm. So therefore it will be easy for you to give to me. I know it's available possibly. I also think it leads people to believe that whoever wrote this note, if it's not covering up an inside job, that it's, it's basically stating, I know your bonus, you know me, right. but, I, but I also think that it's kind of smart. I'm going to make it seem like we're this big organization, well, actually a small foreign faction, but we're a group of people, group of individuals, and if you just do what we say and give us this amount that we know is pretty small to you, this will be done and over with, and I almost think that they picked this amount because they knew it would be available and that possibly because of John's wealth that they'll just go get the money and not contact the authorities. Right. And the interesting thing here too, is we have Steve Thomas who points out that, look, that amount could be important because it could be indicative of his annual bonus that he received that year. Like you pointed out, if somebody else knows that, if somebody that, that wants to stand to gain some money from this whole situation, they know that that money could be readily available rather quickly. That right. this is this is money that this dude can actually get his hands on. We all see people drive fancy cars, live in big fancy mansions. That doesn't necessarily mean that they can get a hold of any cash. They right. might be up to debt in the up. To, up to debt to their eyeballs Mm -hmm. and have no real 
cash, no real liquid money or whatever to pay yes. such a ransom. Stinky hard cash. And then you have to think about the banking system. 118000 for somebody that's a multimillionaire, they can go in there and get that money and one transaction, right? Mm -hmm. If you make the amount too high, half a million or a mil million, that's going to take some time. Again, the more time that this person has to process this, the more likely they are going to go, well, uh, we have to contact authorities. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it becomes this thing where it's like, is this a smart amount? Because they're just going to try to get, look, I don't think the money is the main purpose for any of this. Right. But, but staying fluid in the situation. Right. We discuss it. But this is some evidence that points to that possibly Patsy Ramsey writes the note. Or John Ramsey, or t together they constructed this letter. Yeah. Again, yeah. And I think if they wrote this note together, that would make some sense. Also, it would make some sense on why we have some scratch out marks, right? Oh, no, don't do that. I mean, let's just get into the handwriting analysis. John, they kind of ruled out as being the the author of it. That doesn't mean he didn't help her write it, mm -hmm. but it seems like his handwriting samples don't match at all. Like on a scale to one to 10, he's a zero. But as far as Patsy Ramsey goes, she's on the lowest scale of matching handwriting samples. She's on a very low spectrum of that on like a one to 10. She's at like a, maybe a two, but cannot be cleared. Cannot be cleared. Cannot be ruled out. And what's weird about her, too, is it seems like there's speculation that she actually can write with both hands. Ambidextrous. Yeah, so it's like, um, that's, that's a word I want to put into a ransom note. I can drink beer with both hands. Right. Very talented individual. So here's what's weird about the amount to me, is this is... Just like everything else, and I don't know if we mentioned this last week, Captain, but I know we've talked about this in our personal conversations, our personal talks about the John Benet Ramsey case, is that even the sources you go to to try to find the truth, to try to sift through all the bullshit, 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 and mm -hmm. just get to the truth. Dirty bullshit. And the real hardcore evidence. Mm -hmm. The problem with that, all, even the sources, even the good ones, even people that you and I agree that we respect, they all seem to have an ax to grind. They, they, and so you don't know if you're getting the 100% honest to God's truth. So the public perception for a long time was that, well, it had to be John Ramsey or Patsy Ramsey that wrote the letter, that wrote the ransom letter, because they would be the only ones that would come up with this random amount of $118,000. They would be aware of that because that amount was on their brains because right. of the bonus that he had recently received. Then you have the others, the Ramsey supporters that will say, no, you would have anybody. There could be several people at his company that would be aware of that amount. There could be people at his bank that would be aware of that amount. Right. And the Ramseys were not particularly neat freaks. And they've had a lot of guests. They they always are having guests over to their home. There are people that could have worked at their home or could have been there as a guest and could have seen this information lying about somewhere in the Ramsey home and came up with that amount. So well, I also there's question, a strong argument for either, in my opinion. Yeah, and I also question how braggadocious uh, Patsy Ramsey was. And is it possible that she was telling people at the Christmas party, oh, we'll drink up, you know, because John got a big bonus or whatever. I, I think that's a possibility as well. And th there was a lot of people in and out of that house, like you said, and, and all it would take would be somebody telling somebody that told somebody that told somebody. But this also amount goes to, and I don't want to overlook this too much, uh, Mr. Merrick, I believe his name is. There was a guy that was fired. Jeff Merrick. Yeah, a guy that eventually, you know, John Ramsey said, hey, this is somebody that we should look into. He's making threats. And basically his pay was the, the argument that they had was, you know, around this dollar amount. Hmm. So he was looked into because of these threats and because John could also prove that this dollar amount was pretty much what they were arguing over. 
So he was looked into and his wife was looked into. Now on the high end of the spectrum, I think we talked about him before, uh, Merriman, Mr. Merriman, Mm -hmm. which he was, I think, tested. See, I think Patsy Ramsey wrote the note four times. I think she was tested four times. Again, the more and more samples that she gives you, now you're not comparing note to note. You're comparing note to four notes. Mm -hmm. And that's what led us to the bottom of the barrel that she possibly wrote it. This guy Merriman, he was he actually wrote the note, I believe, seven times. And they actually put him on the higher spectrum. You know, I, on a scale of one to ten, he's maybe eight or nine. He hit more markers. Yeah. If <laughs> if they're looking for nineteen different markers to indicate this is the author of the letter, he's hitting more of those markers than Patsy Ramsey. Yeah. By ten times. And eventually, when they came back and wanted him to write another sample, he said, look, I have wrote enough to fill the Library of Congress. If you want Mm. me to write anything more, come back with handcuffs. Mm. This note doesn't make a lot of sense at all. And this amount doesn't make a lot of sense. But I know that John Douglas and I, I believe another FBI agent profilers have looked at this amount and looked at this note and thought this kind of points to a male in their late teens, maybe early 20s. Because again... Because the amount would be significant to them. Yeah. and I To also, a younger person. But I also think um, that makes a lot of sense. And these guys are experts. I mean, maybe not as much as I am, but they are experts. But I also then question, is there somebody else that this is a lot of... Um, this is a bigger amount to. Where 118,000 might not seem like enough of a reason to kidnap somebody. But again, I don't think that's the reason. I think this is just kind of a icing on the cake. And again, why not pick a smaller amount just to get it done and over with? Well, even $118,000, that's a whole lot of rolling papers. Yeah. So here's the thing. I do want to point out Steve Thomas, his book is fantastic. Regardless if you agree with his opinions and theories on the case, I highly recommend everybody pick that book up and check it out. There's a lot of information in there. Does he have an axe to grind? Everybody that we will (laughs) name, I can't speak for the captain, but my belief is everyone that we name in this seems to have an axe to grind. But I think it's ego. He states, well, and I, but I believe with Steve Thomas, he, he firmly believes he's right. He has some things that to him point out to him that he is right. Yeah. And he's just, he's just trying to push this out to the public and say, look, this is what I believe happened and why. So I'm fine with, with hearing his opinion. One thing he states about this $118,000 amount, this is one thing that is, I've not seen it reported anywhere else. So I want to make sure I bring it up here before we move on. He states that there was some notes that he found in John Ramsey's personal, I don't know if it was a journal or personal Mm -hmm. notes that John Ramsey made about his personal finances. And the number 118,000 was significant as it was referenced within those notes. Now, I don't know if that was liabilities or liquid or what, but it was it was significant according to Steve Thomas in those notes. And so he's pointing out, forget about the bonus because a lot of people could have known about that. Right. This could be a number that's significant to John because of his personal financial notes that, that we found in his office. That's interesting. But then we also have a few other interesting takes on this. One thing that's been pointed out many, many times. And I just have such a, big issue with this whole thing. Look, this case, this investigation is salacious enough without coming up with Halloween stories to add on top of it. Mm -hmm. But there's always been the, the speculation out there throughout the years that, Oh, 118 is significant because it references Psalm 118 from the Bible. And the family Bible inside the Ramsey home was turned to Psalm 118, which discusses child sacrifice and the Ramseys are Satanists. Right. Sorry. That just doesn't make any damn sense. It doesn't add up. 
number one. Number two... Well, and hold on. If you're going to sacrifice one of your kids, I mean, don't you pick the ugly one? I, I don't know... The, I don't know the first thing about child sacrifice or the mm. or sacrificing my own child. Lies. But what I will point out is that law enforcement stated, first of all, the family Bible was not turned to Psalm 118. That never happened. They never found that to be the case. It wasn't marked. It wasn't bookmarked. Mm-hmm. Psalm 118 doesn't seem to hold any significance to this case for the Ramses. On top of that, Read the Bible. Psalm 118 doesn't discuss child sacrifice. So it's just it's just a theory that's all kinds of wrong. It's interesting. It would make for a good movie. You know, if you're putting together a good horror flick, that would be something of interest. But uh, it doesn't seem to mean anything. Now, I like what John Douglas states about the amount of $118,000. He states that, you know, that if you were to convert that money to another currency, Douglas points out that at the time in 1996, $118,000 roughly translates to a million pesos. See. So either pointing out again as a little wink, wink, hint situation that this could be a foreign entity or a foreign person. Or he also states, you know, it could be somebody that was younger and looking to flee the area after receiving the money and, and hide out in Mexico. Yeah. So it's interesting that there are several different reasons for the possibility of this this odd amount. And again, John Ramsey himself agrees that the the number is probably significant to the killer. Now, the phrase I, I actually I should say this, Captain, just before moving on. Also, like other things with this case, it could have no significance at all. It could just be one of those weird things. That's the amount that some crazy sicko on the spot came up with. And that's all, you know, and that's all it means. Yeah. It's totally a coincidence. Then we have the phrase, your account in the letter. This is interesting. The author could have just said the bank, you know, you get the money from the bank right? and not your account. Also, this is implying that the kidnapper knows that there's that dollar amount at least in John Ramsey's account. Then if Patsy Ramsey was the author, then we can see how in targeting the note toward her husband, she would use the phrase your account versus my account. Right. Make, you know, make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. Most kidnappers are not going to remind you to bring an adequate size case to hold the money. Plus this is, got to be a rather uncommon word. Mm-hmm. I can think of only a handful of times other than the Ramsey case where I have even heard the word attache used or seen it on a piece of paper. Yeah. I, again, this to me points, I mean, we, we got to look at intelligence level and I would say that this individual writing the note, whether it's Patsy or somebody else, we know Patsy has a higher education. Uh, if it's not Patsy, it's somebody else with a higher education because I just don't think that they would even try to use that word. Then the suggestion that you be well rested. I'm surprised they didn't write eat oatmeal for breakfast. You're going to need your strength. It, the kidnapper frankly doesn't give a shit if you're well rested right, or not, you know, doesn't care about your feelings or about your your health, your physical well-being. They but, want their money. Right. But again, this could be immaturity. This could be somebody quoting dumb shit from a movie. Window dressing. This could be, yeah, this could be Patsy not understanding how to be uh, as aggressive as maybe as she should. Or this could be somebody that's actually close to the Ramsey family that it, this is like a, you're writing too much. You're giving too much away. And and I think a lot of people believe that little tells like this point to that it's somebody that knows the family. The word attache was written with an accent placed over the letter E. Mm-hmm. Most people in the U.S. do not use this special character. It, it may have been used because the writer wanted the authorities to believe John Bonet was kidnapped by a foreign faction. 
Right. The writer may have used it because he or she is educated. The other thing we have to make take into consideration is that John Bonet's name was written with an accent. Mm-hmm. Patsy Ramsey was accustomed to using the accent when writing her daughter's name. Yeah, she while well, she wanted her daughter's name to sound French. Right. So you will withdraw one hundred and eighteen thousand dollars from your account. One hundred thousand will be in one hundred dollar bills and the remaining eighteen thousand in twenty dollar bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence an earlier pickup of your daughter. Note the author wrote delivery of your daughter. If you see this on, if you go and look up the actual paper, right? Yeah. The author wrote delivery of your daughter, crossed out delivery and wrote pick up of your daughter. So it reads mistakes and all. We might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence an earlier delivery pickup of your daughter. The writer started to say that upon receiving the money, he or they would deliver John Bonet to the parents, then realizing that a kidnapper would not deliver the hostage, right. but would tell the family where she could be found. Therefore, he changed it to pick up. It's doubtful that a, a well-thought-out kidnapper would make this mistake. It's a strong indication that the, the writer was not an experienced criminal. Yeah, which makes this case even more baffling because... The note makes a lot more sense if if it's Patsy writing the note and just really bad at writing a ransom note to cover it up. And this is one of the points where she goes, um, and hence, right? Mm-hmm. She was kind of commonly known to use that phrase. And I believe even Burke uses that phrase when, he, when he's uh, questioned by authorities. But again, is this immaturity? Is this somebody that's just trying to throw people off the scent? But also, we might do this earlier instead of the call. I wonder if you're viewing Patsy as the author. Is this uh, setting up for them to change the plans on the police if they have to? But I also think that depending on when you wrote this note, and in, in what manner you did, this would be kind of a weird thing to kind of come up with off the top of your head. Yeah, let's. there's a lot to really dive into in this couple of sentences, I believe. So first, the word monitor implies a continual surveillance. This is further emphasized when the writer states you and your family are under con- constant scrutiny. The kidnapper would have us believe they are continually watching the Ramsey family, which is very highly unlikely, one. But two, goes back to that line of, if we, you know, if we see you getting the money earlier, we're going to, we'll make earlier arrangements to return your daughter. (laughs) Right. It kind of, it's kind of underlining that, yeah, we are watching you and we will know when you go to get the money. The word hence, as you pointed out, is incredibly interesting. It's not a common word. The word hence is a formal way of saying therefore. The writer starts out the ransom note misspelling words, giving the appearance that they are uneducated. However, his or their educational level begins to show when they use words such as hence. We see the same writing style in the Ramsey's Christmas message, On December 14th, 1997, the First United Methodist Church in Boulder, Colorado, held a memorial service for John Benet. In the program, there was a message, a Christmas message from the Ramsey family. This message was also posted on the Ramsey family's website. In the message, we find the statement, Had there been no birth of Christ, there would be no hope of eternal life, and hence, no hope of ever being with our loved ones again. Yeah, that's suspicious. But if there's also a, and hence, 
in their Christmas letter. Maybe it's, again, somebody that got that Christmas letter. But this is the year hints. after she was killed. No, but didn't you say that there was, and that there was a, in the original Chris, Christmas letter that people would have got in 1996? Is there no enhance in that one? I would have to go back and review that. I don't believe that there is a and hence, but there, this, this fact is from their December 14th, 1997 message. This is a memorial to John Bonet. Right. So that's very suspicious towards Patsy Ramsey. But if, again, like I said, Burke a couple times says, and hence, and his, I guess you can call it interrogation tapes, questioning tapes. Is it just somebody that's close to the family and knows that, and hence is something that Patsy Ramsey uses, so therefore I, I use it in my letter? Not so much suspicious towards Patsy Ramsey, but more of a clue that, hey, I know you. We're close. You know, you want to hear one sad thing. You you mentioned their Christmas letter, and I, I forgot about this. this. There's so many things involved in this case, so many details involved in this case. And regarding their Christmas letter that we, we discussed last week, that they sent out to their friends and family. Yeah. They sent it out so late in December. I believe I've heard the statement that everyone... But just for the sake of being fair and not having that in my notes specifically, I will state that 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 statement was most of the people receiving, most of the recipients of that letter received it on December 26th, the same day that they had to tell friends and family that John Bonet was killed. Right. So just what a sad, sad thing for friends and family you get this happy, cheery message about the Ramsey family and then find out that same day the little girl that you read about in their Christmas message has been killed. Yeah. Also in these statements, in this letter, we have an unnecessary word over. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter... Unnecessary words are words that can be taken out of a sentence, taken out of this letter completely, and the sentence still makes sense. The writer could have stated, the two gentlemen watching your daughter, extra words give us extra information. What is the difference between watching over someone and watching someone? According to statementanalysis.com, they say the best example is in reference to God. If someone were to say that God is watching over me, then you have God keeping his distance. He sees the person, he or she. I don't want to get into that argument. He or she sees the person, but also sees the entire world at the same time. God can see the person because they are a part of the world. While God is watching over that person, they are also watching over others. The word over means God is spreading his watchful eye upon the earth. Now, if someone were to write or to say God is watching you, it becomes more personal. It's a focused attention. Right. Another example would be if a friend asked you to watch over his house while he was out of town. In this case, he probably wants you to stop by every once in a while and make sure everything is okay. Maybe you'll pick up the mail, water the plants, whatever. However, if he asks you to watch his house, he probably wants you to house it, to stay there. Right. He wants you to be there where you can keep a close eye on things. So uh, December 26th, I think something else that we should point out is this would have been a Thursday. So, yes, people are off work normally on Christmas, but there's a lot of people that go back to work on that Thursday. So if it's not written by Patsy Ramsey, I believe it would have to be written by somebody that knew that they had time to do this that day. Possibly somebody that doesn't have a job or or is off work, which it could be a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But I think that's important to point out. Well, Santa Claus just spent the whole time working just 
before that. So I'm sure he is off and resting on that day. Statement analysis goes on while we're talking about words that are unnecessary. They go on to add in a kidnapping. The kidnappers should be watching the abductee, meaning the word watching is also unnecessary. It would be understood. They will want to keep a close eye on her. They want to make sure she does not escape or alert someone that she needs help. They will want to make sure she doesn't harm herself if her being alive is dependent upon them receiving the ransom. When the writer of the ransom note said they were watching over John Bonet, the writer was telling us they were not keeping a close eye on her. There are only two reasons why you would not closely watch your hostage. One, if you knew for certain she was all right and could not escape or two, if you knew she was dead. Yeah. Since a dead body isn't going anywhere, it is something you watch over, not keep a close eye on. Right. So let's be clear about this. If it's Patsy Ramsey or somebody in the Ramsey household, then we know that John Bonet is dead. And so some of this stuff points to that, right? Mm -hmm. My issue has always been the person, if it's an intruder, they had time. So why wouldn't you write the note beforehand? If the goal was to take John Bonet out of the house, the whole kidnapping could just be a ruse. They maybe they didn't even want money. They just, are going to use this as a ruse to give them more time. Right. Watching over and all that stuff might not make any sense. I, to me, it's less likely that the intruder takes her to the basement, kills her on purpose or on an accident, and then decides to write a note. My gut feeling says if it's an intruder, the note was written before the death of John Bonet mm -hmm. and it's just immaturity, not a seasoned criminal, not a, you know, but I, I also think a lot of the stuff is leading to somebody with a decent education, decent ability to write. I believe the person is giving too many clues on that. They're close to the family. And again, I don't know if the, the dollar amount matters at all. Mm hmm. Yeah, I want to stay on this for a little bit because I personally do not believe that the what statementanalysis.com is stating here in its simplest form is that based on the language used in the letter, it appears that the writer already knew that John Bonet was dead when writing the ransom note. Right. I don't really firmly agree with that. And I think that when they say that, they are trying to indicate that that means that it has to be Patsy and John or, or Patsy by herself writing this letter already knowing that the daughter is dead. Right. I, I don't believe that so much, but staying, staying on this idea of additional words or unnecessary words, I go back to the, we are a small foreign faction. We are a group of individuals. The men watching over your daughter, this is a group. Mm -hmm. The watching over could actually apply. The watching over your daughter could make sense as we can't assume we know everything that the kidnapper has planned, regardless of the long letter left on the spiral staircase. This watching over could be intended to imply simply the men took your daughter. I am the mastermind of this operation and I'm leaving the ransom note after the fact they are elsewhere watching over your daughter. The two men watching over your daughter do not particularly like you. When we look at a copy of the ransom letter, we find the writer originally wrote do particularly like you. The word not was written above the space between the words do and particularly. A, a line was then drawn indicating that the word not should be inserted between these words. All right. Then we have any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. The two gentlemen I'm watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., will result in your daughter being beheaded. Saying that John Bonet will be beheaded 
is very unusual. Statement analysis says in the United States, we generally do not talk about beheading people. This was put in the note in their opinion to make it look like a foreign faction was being behind this kidnapping. Right now for me, captain, this is the line that I have always questioned the most. Let's say John Bonet died in some kind of accident and then the parents covered it up, which is a very popular theory. So they cover it up and then write this ransom letter. They would still be very upset about the death of their small child. They would still be grieving parents in a way. I can't, I have a very difficult time believing that parents for any reason would reference the beheading of their own child. Right. That It's not necessary to throw that in that note to cover up an accidental death or something else. Yeah, the small foreign faction and the beheading makes me think, and the season, right? Tis mm-hmm. the season for one of the best Christmas movies of all time. And if you don't think it's a Christmas movie, you're just wrong. Die Hard. It makes me think that somebody watched Die Hard too much and went, oh, yeah, foreign faction, uh, you know, beheading. This is the terms that they would use. Right. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. If you alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You will be scanned for electronic devices, and if any are found, she dies. Four times the writer uses the phrase, she dies. If John Bonet was still alive, the writer should have been speaking in the future tense. She will die. This is a strong indication that the re- the writer again knows that John Bonet was dead at the time. This is again that same website kind of pointing out to th- that we could have a cover up here by the parents. Yeah, again, the cover up makes more sense than but as far as the she dies, okay, well then she they would say, well, she will die. Mm-hmm. This could be somebody going, well, that's this would sound more like a terrorist would talk. That's she, right. She dies. And then after this, she dies. This this is this would be the terrorist or the threat level being turned up, crank it up to eleven. Mm-hmm. Right? Scare the hell out of the out of the parents. Now I really like this portion that I found here. It states there are three times when the writer used an exclamation point. Exclamation points, as we all know, are used to add emphasis to the statement. Listen carefully. This has an exclamation point. In talking about killing John Bonet, the writer does not use any exclamation points. Four times the writer wrote, She dies. We would expect this to be a point of emphasis in the letter, yeah. but did not use them when talking about killing John Bonet. This too may indicate that John Bonet was already dead and the author knew this at this time. There are, and you, you've been kind of hinting at this all day long here, there are several movie references or close to quotes found within this ransom letter in the movie Dirty Harry, Inspector Harry Callahan, Clint Eastwood, I love Clint Eastwood, is looking for Scorpio, a man who kidnapped a little girl. When talking to Scorpio on the phone several times, Scorpio tells Inspector Callahan that if he does not follow his orders... The girl dies, as opposed to saying the girl will die. In the movie, the girl was already dead. In the ransom note, John Bonet was already dead. Another very interesting thing is the letter only names John Ramsey by name, no one else. First, it's Mr. Ramsey, and then simply John. Yeah. The note is addressed to Mr. Ramsey. However, towards the end of the letter, Mr. Ramsey becomes John. Well, don't we have a practice note at some point? Yes. Where yes. It's, uh, it's addressed to both of them? So in the believed or what is called the uh, rough draft or the first draft, often referred to as the practice note, practice letter, they find in the same notepad, it's believed that, that this ransom letter came from the same notepad that they later found at the top of a page, somebody wrote, Mr. and Mrs. I. It looks like I because what the the authorities state mm-hmm. is that that is the downstroke for a capital R. 
that the intention was for it to be Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey. And then before even completing the capital R, the author changed their mind and then decided to address the letter simply to Mr. Ramsey, just to John. <laughs> right, which, look, this is a pad that... The, the, <laughs> this stuff drives me nuts because it's like the, the housekeeper could have said, I'm going to write a note real quick to Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey or anybody else that worked at the house could have sat down. So, yes, they believe it's possibly a practice note, but there's also other explanations or other things that you can speculate that is that there was no practice note. We don't have anybody to claim that 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 little letter right there. You know, the Mr. and Mrs. I. Right. I think if somebody were to claim that it would be easy more easy to dismiss. But because we don't have that, it may appear to most that it, a possible practice letter. Nobody's saying definitively that it was. Right. But there is evidence to certainly point that it could be. You and your family are under constant scrutiny as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good southern common sense of yours. It is up to you now, John. Again, this is pointing, I think, to somebody that's closer to the family than this small foreign faction. But also, it simply can put point towards Patsy Ramsey. Well, yeah, I mean, this is an indicator that the the author of the letter has some general knowledge of John. It's it's same as the the dollar amount. Right. It's same as knowing that he would be able to pay this amount. Use that good southern sense of yours, that good southern common sense of yeah, yours. Yeah, no, knowing that he's from Atlanta. Right. And then addressing him as John. I'll tell you what, though, for all the reasons that many people point out that the letter itself shows no level of criminal sophistication, I want to point to one sentence that I believe shows a good deal of understanding and criminal sophistication regarding getting the ransom. And that is, don't try to grow a brain, John. And we know that that's referenced probably from a movie from, from speed where he says, uh, don't grow a brain. I'm on top of you or says something like that. Right. And that that's a, that's an individual that's looking to collect a ransom in the movie. But this line right here, Captain, you are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. That, to me, shows some criminal sophistication right there. That, to me, is the person who's demanding the ransom to say, you know what? On top of that, don't deviate from these things because there's a lot of people that say, well, you don't pay a ransom because you know right away that the killer, the, the abductor will not kill the abducted person, the abductee. Because if they do kill, then the likelihood of getting the ransom goes down significantly. They've not they've not upheld their end of the bargain. Yeah, but I like saying, this line because they're saying, don't deviate from us because guess what? We don't care. We will kill your daughter, and then we will take somebody else's kid, and we'll give them a ransom. And somebody will pay us eventually. So don't try to outsmart us here. Just be. This is a very short way of saying don't try to outsmart us here. Just do the right thing and pay us. Because mm -hmm. we'll do this again. We're not we're not worried about giving you your daughter back. We're not worried about losing out on the ransom because we because you screw up and we have to kill her. Well, so you have one line that we believe is coming from Dirty Harry, but you say that there's a kidnapping there. So that's interesting. And then the fact that there's another line that we go, oh, that might be from Speed and there's a ransom there. I wonder if we're missing other lines from movies well, in Dirty Harry, there's the line, if we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. Um, well, sorry, that's from the, the ransom letter. But it sounds like from Dirty Harry, if we, if you talk to anyone, even if it's a Pekingese on a lamppost, right. peeing on a lamppost, the girl dies. That's from Dirty Harry. Are we missing some other references to movies? And, and to me, then that's a, again... I, I find it hard to think that John and Patsy, their daughter is it's an accidental death, right? And they're trying to cover up for their son. This is their 
child. It doesn't have to be cover up for their son, though. There's, you know, anybody could be or, guilty, right, guilty right. of the, the accidental death. But it, right, right, you're right. But what I'm saying is, this is our beloved daughter. This is, I, I love so, somebody point. So, somebody said, uh, well, even if they didn't care about their daughter, they would have they would have been upset about their investment. Who who makes those claims towards parents? There there is no evidence that John and Pats, Patsy were horrible Satan worshippers and didn't give a shit about their little daughter. So if there was there was an accidental death, whoever's responsible. At the end of the day, we have a dead six year old daughter. So I think for them to sit around and come up with this letter, to me, it's cutesy. Oh well throw in that line about what you know what did dirty harry say oh yeah say something like that what was that movie what was that line in speed yeah say something like that it's too cutesy Mm -hmm. their six-year-old daughter died and it and and in this case for whatever reason it's like oh well they got a little bit of money that doesn't make them monsters she spent a lot of time with her daughter no matter what you think that is you know, and I, I'm also so sick and tired of people going, well, they, they set her up and they put her in a position where there's all these pedophiles. And, and so really, even if they didn't kill her, if they're not covering up an accidental death, that they really brought this upon their daughter. Oh, give me a break. Your kids ain't safe anywhere. I, I have friends that have been molested by teachers, counselors, Boy Scout leaders, bus drivers, soccer coaches. Priest, pedophiles are everywhere. So it's just the the claims that we can make when there's no evidence beforehand or afterwards of them being horrible, malicious people. It's just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like I said, it's too cutesy. Oh, let's try to throw in some movie quotes. Well, there's no evidence of them being horrible, malicious people beforehand either. So right. This, to me, is the most interesting portion of the letter. And actually, it's what is not in the letter. Patsy is not named. John Bonet is not named, but is referenced as your daughter or she. Right. This is interesting because what if it's possible that the person that wrote the letter did not know the little girl's name or, at the very least, did not know how to spell John Bonet? That's not a common name. I can't think of anybody else that, that shares that name. Right. Is it possible that they avoided that name because they didn't know how to spell it? Also, could the intruder have only known John Ramsey's name? Yeah. It's a difficult one because you think, you know, with the intruder theory, a lot of people go, this, this person must've been obsessed with this little girl. Well, if you're obsessed with her, wouldn't you know how to spell her name? And also, if you wrote the note beforehand and then brought it with you or or wrote a note beforehand and brought that with you and then copied it down and you were obsessed with her, why why wouldn't you put her name? But again, maybe there's all these little tells that if it's an intruder that they know the family well, right? But maybe that was their... their I, I actually to disagree be, with that. I think that it... The only indicators that we have is that the intruder may know John well. Again, pointing out no Patsy, no John Bonet, all the references that that would indicate that they know of the family. And I, I, maybe you're just using family in a loose term there. Right. But it's all towards John. Mr. Ramsey, John, we respect your business. Uh, we know that you're wealthy. $118,000. Use that good Southern sense of yours. Right. All John. And there are theories out there, intruder theories, that persons believe that the intruder, yeah, did they do some horrible things to John Bonet? Yeah, they killed her, but the 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 intent was to was to harm John Ramsey. Right. Be it on an emotional level or whatever, not on a physical level, but that that was the motivating factor for the death, for the murder, or the abduction of this little girl was to hurt and possibly destroy John Ramsey that the the killer or the abductor had was seeking revenge against him or was or sought to destroy this man. Yeah. It makes sense to just focus it on John if you're 
if the writer is patsy because what would make you think that you should focus on yourself right so that's where i think people go oh this had to be patsy's doing and here's the thing too and i'm glad you point that out because that's something that i think most people kind of skip over when they look at this case you hear so many people go oh it was the parents or it had to be the parents you can run different scenarios in your head where it doesn't have to be the parents. It could be a parent, right? It could have been one or the other. It doesn't have to be a united front of, of the two, right? Because, two killed, well, yeah. covered up. And then it's the two of them against the world going forward. Right. Because what's interesting in this case is you have a lot of people that think Patsy was up all night long and that her husband, he took a sleeping aid. So he passed out. And what if all this stuff happened and now she is responsible or she feels that she's responsible and she doesn't think that John will understand so that she has to cover this all up on her own. It's possible. But I also think when I think about the intruder theory is that maybe this person had a affection for Patsy as well. And that that's why they didn't put her in the letter. They didn't name her. You know what I mean? Like if I'm going to talk trash to somebody, I'll talk a little, I'll talk a little stick to John, but I wouldn't do that to Patsy. So I'm not going to do that in the letter. When you say that this individual would have it out for John, right? Mm -hmm. The evidence against that is if you have more hatred towards somebody, you're not going to be so polite. You're going to, right. you're going to spew a lot more venom. And that doesn't happen. And, you know, you know, don't think you're the only fat cat around. Don't what? Like, so you're, you're kind of giving them a compliment just in that statement. You would think a lot of, more of like, John, use a piece of shit and you're going to pay us. And you know, you're a horrible person and your and your business sucks. You know what I mean? Like, but they're too complimentary to him. So I, I, I doubt the hatred. Then we have the weird ending of the letter, the victory SBTC. Yeah. SBTC, it appears there's no period after the letter C, just after the other three letters. People have, for so many years, have wondered what could SBTC mean? That has always been one of the most popular questions in this case. One of the most popular theories is that it stands for Subic Bay Training Center. Right. Subic Bay is a bay on the west coast of the island of Luzon in the Philippines, about 100 kilometers northwest of Milana Bay, an extension of the South China Sea. Its shores were formerly the site of a major United States Navy facility named U.S. Naval Base Subic Bay, which is now the location of an industrial and commercial area known as the Subic Bay Freeport Zone under the Subic Bay Metropolitan Authority. We point this out because many people have su suggested that John Ramsey, who was stationed at Subic Bay, may have come up with this SBTC because it means Subic Bay Training Center. However, in the description that we just gave you, it clearly tells you that there is no entity that exists with that name. Right. Subic Bay Training Center. That's not what that place was called. And as far as I could find, there is no training facility station there. Th nobody would have any reason to refer to the United States Navy facility named U.S. Naval Base Subic Bay as Subic Bay Training Center. Another possibility, Captain, is that SBTC could mean saved by the cross which could mean a number of different things. Statement analysis says this is because of the Ramsey's professed faith in God and because the word victory precedes the initials SBTC. As all Christians know, it is through Christ's sacrifice on the cross that we have victory over death. The Ramseys were religious and attended church, as we mentioned in the timeline. Patsy beat cancer, too. And it has also been suggested that Saved by the Cross is a reference to Patsy's victory over cancer. SBTC could 
could have meaning to the perpetrator or to the perpetrator's relationship to the Ramses or John Bonet or what is probably the most likely situation is that it means nothing at all, that it has no real relevance to the case at all. Mm -hmm. I believe Patsy at one point when asked what SBTC could mean, she said, son of a bitch, Tom Carter. Right. <laughs> which was someone the family knew but that of course just seems like like kooky talk i mean it's just yeah she had no filter really right she, right well you know. i you know what i do like that about her there is a certain charm john has too much filter right and then patsy has no filter yeah it's uh son of a bitch tom card well there is a guy that they they look into and in one of the new documentaries where he would sign his name he had like aliases uh and the t would stand for truth so it was his alias but he would put truth in there but again they they once you do more research they you go well this guy was connected to colorado but he couldn't have been there at the time so i think everybody's grabbing at straws for this one I question the letters themselves, though. S B T C. That's what we're assuming it is, because again, I think one of the things that really points to the fact that Patsy didn't write this note, because if she's calling nine one one, this would have been not much after she already wrote the note, right? It could have been minutes, could have been hours, right? And they ask her, "Who wrote the note?" Who's it from? And you almost hear you have to, you almost hear the thinking, the wheels turning, and she has to go to the back and say S B T C. Then she reads up victory. Mm -hmm. If she wrote this note, she would yeah. Your your knee jerk reaction would be to say victory S B T C or, or just simply S B T C. Yeah, without a pause. Who wrote the note? S B T C. Okay, well, more likely that she wrote the note. But when she has to search through it, because she claims she didn't even read the whole note. Mm -hmm. She got to the point where the, you have my daughter. Oh, shit. I got to go check on my daughter. Oh, shit. John. John. Yeah, come help me. Oh, we, you know, John maybe reads the note. Maybe doesn't. Maybe gets to the same part. We got to call the police. And then at some point you're going, oh, shit. Now we call the police, but they're telling us not to call the police. But again, she reads up and she says, SBTC, victory. Mm -hmm. If she wrote the note, like you said, start with victory, SBTC, or say SBTC quicker. I question the letters. And this is what I mean by this. Patsy Ramsey is the one that determined this is SBTC. This is pretty sloppy handwriting. I don't know if that T is a T or if it was supposed to be Possibly a J. A J. Because if you look at every other T. Son of a bitch, John Carter. Son of a bitch, John Carter. <laughs> if you look at every other T, the bottom swoosh of the T goes out to the right. And when you look at this T, it almost looks like there's a dot. Um, well, it is a felt tip pen. Okay, so... I do want to throw this in there. According to Steve Thomas, they had verification from the Secret Service, the United States Secret Service, mm -hmm. that one of the felt tip pens in the little, you know, everybody's got their little pen and pencil holder that contains multiple pens and pencils, that that pen and pencil holder contained a felt tip pen that authored the letter, according to Steve Thomas and according to what he states is proof from the secret service that they were able to determine that the, the dye or the ink, I guess would be better to say mm. was, a, was a perfect match for one particular pen in that, that holder. Well, I point that out felt tip pen, because if you, anybody that's used them often knows if you just kind of hesitate to pick up your pen, it will leave what, what looks to be a dot at the bottom of a letter or at the, at the end of a stroke that you just finished. Yeah. Which I get. But again, I think this is more deliberate. And the reason why is because look at every U when they Y O U right at the bottom of the Y 
what happens with their pin naturally goes to the right look at a hundred percent when they make the percent sign where does the pin go naturally t- to the right do you see that what was the last one you just stated I'm, I'm reviewing the u's so if you look at the u's the bottom of the y always starts curving to the right even on the on the d's the bottom of the d's oh if you look at the word u when you say u i thought you meant the letter u um, yeah, you're right. With the the Y at the start of the word U, and at the end of the word victory, I can see right here on page three. Yeah, it 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 goes to the right a little bit. Yeah, and then if you look at hundred percent at the bottom of the percent sign, it goes to the to the right, and that happens over and over. Almost every Y goes down and to the right. Uh, even the F's. And you're like right, on the if. J it goes to the left. Uh, well, on the T it goes to the left, making it a possible J. Yes, just but only on the SBTC. So I think it's possible that the person started hurrying through this a little bit more, and that is a SBJC, right? Could be, yeah. And could this, so... Son of a bitch, Jesus Christ, is that what it is? No. No. (laughs) (laughs) It could mean anything. Again, it could mean nothing at all. It could be, here, look, the truth of the matter at the end of the day is the ransom note is a farce. However you want to spin it, whoever you believe to be involved, it's a fake. Meaning, whoever wrote it never intended to receive any ransom. I believe that 100%. Okay, so what you're saying is, if it's written by somebody in the family, they're you know, covering it up. They're making they're they're making it look like it's something else. Yeah, and they're it's either a, covering it's a farce. up a, an accident or they're covering up a murder. Yeah. Okay. If it's an intruder, it could just be a false. It could be a farce from the beginning, and they're still planning on taking her, and that just doesn't work out. And then they left the scene and move about their business. I think it very likely that given what we, we know of the wine cellar and what we suspect of the body of John Bonet, that if this person or this group had any intention of taking this little girl and removing her from the home, that this letter was constructed to buy them time. Meaning when the, the thing with the intruder, I'm kind of with you, and I'm not saying that I believe it to be an intruder, but if it were, if I were to say, yes, I believe this was an intruder that's responsible for the murder of John Bonet, I believe that the, the intruder theory only works if the letter was written, was constructed before the ad- attempted abduction of this girl. Right. And that there was no really true intention to ever return her there was no true intention to collect on that ransom that this would have been more likely a sexually motivated crime and the letter was constructed to buy this sicko some additional time right and that could be for either any number of purposes or just simply for the purpose of getting away of fleeing the area or distancing themselves from the crime itself don't contact police if i if i can do anything to stall law enforcement from the if i can do anything to stall the experts from getting involved then i'm going to do that because we we all know if you don't solve this thing in the first 48 you don't have a suspect in the first 48 first 72 time is the killer time makes it more difficult to solve these cases and this is a particularly complicated one And so I believe that if it were even an intruder, the idea would be to distance themselves from the investigation, to slow the start and progression of that investigation. I point to that for several reasons, because even if somebody, look, we, we know that she's killed. We know that she's killed somewhere in that home. And then the body is left somewhere in that home. Even if the kill, the person killed her, had intended to take her for the purpose of a ransom, you would still remove the body because you could still collect on that ransom even though she's dead. The parents don't know that she's dead. Right. 
And even and even if they were, even the sentence of denied a proper burial indicates that the author of the letter understands that even the return of a dead body has some value. So I don't really believe that there was ever in any intention of collecting on a ransom. And we went through the timeline. I will contact you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to give you instructions. There was no contact. Nobody ever reached out for any reason at all. I, I think it is also very important to keep in mind. I, I think one of the smartest things that, that Steve Thomas added to this case is where he states that 8 to 10 a.m. is so confusing because we don't know what the author means by 8 to 10 a.m. Because this crime, we, we're talking, this all went down in the middle of the night. If, if the abductor it, attempted the abduction after midnight, well, then 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. tomorrow could mean the next day. So I, I think it's all, it, it's all Doesn't very make a lot interesting. Of sense. Yeah. And I, again, I think, um, uh, I believe that the person, if it was an intruder, they, they wrote it beforehand and either copied their own note and tried to make a couple corrections to it or whatever. Yeah. And, and that's why we have those little scribble marks, but I think they, they wrote it beforehand. There's too many cutesy, like little references and little things about like Hollywood, not even so much. Even if you say they're not quoting any movie, it just sounds like stuff that would come from a movie. They could just be quoting things or, or not specifically quoting movies, but just, again, grabbing window dressing that, that, that comes to mind. Right. When they think of, oh, what would a, what would a kidnapper who wants a ransom write? Right. What, what do I think a ransom letter should look like? And that's why I think it, it's what what I believe, and I'll go forward, moving forward with this, is that I believe the ransom note is, the ransom letter is a complete farce, and that either points to, it points to motive for me. Either it's a cover-up, an inside job that had to be covered up, or it was in fact an intruder, and the whole purpose of the ransom letter was constructed in advance and it was constructed to slow the investigation, to to delay the start of the investigation. Maybe the parents don't call 911 right away because they're scared and they believe the letter. They right. believe they're going to get their daughter back. That doesn't have to have any indicator whether the author knew in advance that they were going to take the girl or or kill the girl inside. It has no nothing to do with that at all. It just points, everything in this letter points to me that nobody had any intention of collecting. Okay, so, Crispy Colonel, if if you had to bet, right, right now, if, if, if you had to wager your whole life savings. Mm-hmm. $118,000. $118,000. And you had to wager that against a small foreign faction. Is this coming from inside the ramsey family or is this coming from outside the ramsey family okay i would walk up to the window to the the betting window and i would place fifty nine thousand dollars that the author of the letter was an intruder Mm -hmm. and then i would place my i would wager my remaining fifty nine thousand dollars that one of the ramseys or both the ramseys wrote the letter how you like that wager right there? Yeah, that's a horrible answer. <laughs> I'm going to go if I had to bet it's an intruder. Simply Safe is my choice for home security. It's comprehensive professional home security at a fair price and right now is the best time of year to get a simply safe security system my listeners get a free security camera plus a huge discount on your security system visit simplysafe.com slash garage to get a free camera plus simply safe's holiday savings this offer is for a limited time only and it's ending soon visit simplysafe.com slash garage today that's simplysafe.com slash garage introducing the jeffrey epstein i knew 
a new podcast from CNN, hosted by Vicki Ward. This seven-episode series takes you behind the scenes to hear a one-of-a-kind account of Epstein, an individual who's more myth than man. Vicki Ward has been reporting on Jeffrey Epstein for almost two decades and takes listeners beyond the headlines to explore who Jeffrey Epstein really was, where he got his money, and the circumstances surrounding his death. Subscribe to The Jeffrey Epstein I Knew wherever you get your podcast. Wow, what an episode. Almost two hours of us and I'm smacking white. our gums. Yeah. We want to thank everybody for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for sharing on social media for everything True Crime Garage. Check out truecrimegarage.com. Download the Stitcher app. Check out our other show, Off the Record, on Stitcher Premium. Do not forget to join us back here tomorrow for episode four. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. We'll be right back.